Hey, welcome back to the next video in the how to write an essay series. This one is about persuasive and rhetorical techniques. Remember, share, like and subscribe if you haven't already. If you have, thank you very much. Extra bonus point, see if you can find the pop culture reference to an international boy band somewhere in this video. So let's start. So what are persuasive devices and rhetorical techniques? So throughout the series, you've heard me mention persuasive and rhetorical devices and techniques. Some you're going to know and some you won't. And this is going to go into more depth with examples of the different ways to persuade people to your way of thinking by using writing. So we're going to start with Aristotle's appeals. So Aristotle was a Greek philosopher who was considered the father of modern philosophy. Other things you may know about him was that he was a student of Plato, another Greek philosopher, and he was also the private tutor of Alexander the Great. So he had a theory that you needed three main features to be persuasive. Logos, which is logical argument and appeal to logic and reason. This is very similar to using facts within your speech, article or letter. Ethos, appeals based on the reliability, credibility or expertise of the writer. The idea that you're more likely to listen to scientific facts from a scientist than you are from a history teacher. I'm not saying that history teachers don't know science, but it's just an example. And pathos appeals to the audience's needs, values or emotion. This is very similar to emotive language. You're trying to appeal to your audience in order to get them to see your way of thinking. So rhetorical devices are techniques using language to increase the persuasiveness of your writing. So the ones mentioned on, on this video are not the only ones, but are some of the more effective ones you can find and use. So questions. Everyone knows rhetorical questions. So they're thoughtful questions that aren't meant to be answered. An example of this would be, could we perhaps do more for our young people? So a question asked to get your audience to think. Another type of question is hyperphora. So asking a question and answering it. Did we truly want to wait for hours in the cold? Yes, we did. This is to get your audience to agree with you. They may not be on your side already, but using hyperphora could get them to start thinking more like you and that you may actually have a point. Figurative language. So using metaphor, simile and personification to create imagery. I'm going to assume you guys know what metaphor, simile and personification are, but I will give examples anyway. So similes, it, he has learned gymnastics and is agile as a monkey. So you're comparing something using like and as. Metaphor, my friend is a Shakespeare when in English class. So metaphor is saying something is something else. In this case, that your friend is Shakespeare when in English class. And personification, the sky weeps. So you're given inanimate objects, human characteristics or features. Anaphora. So the intentional repetition of a word or phrase at the beginning of a line for emphasis. You may have already heard of anaphora in poetry, but it can be used in persuasive writing as well. So every day, every night, in every way, I am even better and better. The repetition of the word every is emphasizing the importance of the word, as if to say it's constant. Rule of three. So the rule of three is a writing principle that suggests that a trio of events or characters are more humorous, satisfying or effective than other numbers. So you may think, why three? Sometimes it's easier to remember things that are in a group of three than it is to remember something in four, five or six. That's why rule of three is there. So good speeches are peppered with lists with three items. Friends, Romans, countrymen. That's from William Shakespeare's Julius Caesar. It's Blood, Sweat and Tears by General Patton or BTS. And our priorities are education, education, education by Prime Minister Tony Blair. Each time a list of three has been used, it's been easily remembered 
and a lot of people can quote these back to you. Hence why they've managed to stand the test of time. Hyperbole. Exaggerated statements or claims not meant to be taken literally. He's running faster than the wind. This bag weighs a ton. This is the worst day of my life. The shopping cost me a million dollars. My dad will kill me when he comes home. So these are all hyperbole, exaggerated in order to make a point. Some of them are humorous, some of them are a bit more serious, and some of them are to show fear or anxiety. Anecdote. A short, interesting story taken from your past experiences or of someone you know. So an anecdote will create a bond between the writer and the reader or the speaker and the audience. So, for example, if a group of students are discussing pets and one student tells a story about how her cat comes downstairs at a certain time every night, then that person has shared an anecdote. It's something pretty innocuous, but it creates a link between the speaker and the reader. Euphemisms and connotations. So a euphemism is an indirect word or expression substituted for one considered to be too harsh or blunt. So when you're trying to say something, but you're trying to moderate the way you say it, so you either don't offend or upset the person you're saying it to. Connotations. A connotation is a commonly understood cultural or emotional association that some word or phrase carries. Here are some examples for euphemisms and connotations. So overweight versus fat. You may say that in order to not offend somebody, but people tend to associate overweight as being fat as a connotation. Issue versus problem. And ignorant versus racist. So these are all things that can be euphemisms or connotations. Distinction. It's an intentional reference or definition of a word in order to remove confusion, misunderstanding or ambiguity. When you are dis showing something as a distinction, you're trying to show them that it's an important word or that it can mean something else. So example, if I use the word impossible to describe independent AI or artificial intelligence, by impossible, I mean not something we are currently capable of doing, but it doesn't mean that I think it will never happen. Yeah, it's just an example of this of distinction. So showing that I'm by what I mean by impossible. So you explaining what you mean by impossible. Apotheses. Mentioning something by claiming you won't. This tends to be used a lot within speech and occasionally letter. So we shall not discuss the terrible state of the current education system. So you claim you didn't want to discuss it. However, by you saying that you won't discuss it and calling it a terrible state, you've mentioned it. And that is apothesis. So things to remember. You don't have to use all the techniques shown. You can also use techniques that are not in this video. I know there were some that I didn't mention, so you can use them and you're not wrong. However, you have, you must, 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 must use techniques. If you don't, then you're not going to get the marks. <laughs> so I'm going to give you a homework task. Choose five of the persuasive techniques from the video and make your own examples. You can just write them down in your book. You can just practice them within a essay question or you can leave them below in a comment. I don't mind, but I'd appreciate if you did it because it's there to help you. It's not going to benefit me, but I do want it to benefit you. So if you're more comfortable with using the techniques, then you'll be better at using them within your actual exams. OK, so was this useful? Nice little roundup at the end. Share, like and subscribe. Leave a comment if you have any questions or if you want to leave any examples for yourself or for others. And I will see you next time.